Well, good evening. How are we doing tonight? So far, so good? Good. Well, as always, let us begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give you praise and thanksgiving for this evening, for this day, for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us, for this beautiful weather, for this fall season, and thanksgiving for the rain that we received this week, um, and for the many blessings that you bestowed upon us, we give you praise and thanksgiving. So we come here tonight to talk about virtue, to continue to seek to grow in virtue. We pray that you may continue to work on our minds, work in our hearts, work on our very lives. Help us to see who you are and seek to emulate you in everything that we do and in everything that we are. We ask all of these things in your Son's name as we pray together in the words that our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's good to be back with you guys. I'm glad um, that we are back to class. Um, we got the week off last week. Many of you, your kids had a uh, fall break last week. I know Weatherford's got their fall break this week, so Elk City's actually playing another Thursday night game um, for football, I think, in Weatherford this week because they've got their, spring, their fall break. Um, must be nice to have that extra time off. I like this time of year, too, because I'm gone a lot, too, but unfortunately, it's not vacation. It's just other stuff. Um, so uh, two weeks ago, when we had our last class, uh, we started talking about the Catholic virtues, um, the book I've been talking about uh, this fall. Um, and so we're going to continue um, kind of with the intro um, into what is virtue, where do virtues come from, what's the point of virtue um, in our lives. And so really, both sets of virtues that we've been talking about, the theological virtues and the cardinal virtues, ultimately what they do is show us the love of God. Through the person of Christ, we see these virtues made present, and because of who Christ is and how he lived his life, they give us insights into how we too are called to live our own lives. Um, in cultivating these virtues, ultimately the goal is for us to become Christ-like. I talk a lot about um, death. I talk a lot about how everything in our lives is about what? It's about how do we get to heaven, right? Um, I was having a conversation with one of our parishioners this afternoon, and um, it, it always brings to mind for me the juxtaposition or the polar opposites that we see in life of the thing we're called to long for the most is what? Heaven. The thing that allows us to get to heaven is what? Death. We can't get to heaven unless we die. These seem like polar opposites in our lives, but ultimately they lead, one leads to the other. So how do we then, in our lives, allow ourselves to live not for this life, but for the life to come? Um, that, that's why having these classes at the same time that our kids are in class, that your kids are in class, is important because I, just like the, the virtues help us to model our lives after Christ, you as parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, family members of those who are in class down the hall, they see what you do, and then they want to follow that. Um, how many times, for you guys that have kids that are either grown or are growing up, how many times have your kids called you a hypocrite? Has that ever happened to any of you guys? You just say one thing and do the exact opposite. You say to me, do what I say, not what I do. We hear that a lot, right? Been there, done that. Guilty myself as a priest. That's why many times as a priest, one of my prayers, um, when, when we have daily mass, when we pray for the pope, we pray for the bishop, we pray for the priests, is that we may, as priests and leaders of the faith, practice what it is we preach. Because for me, as an extemporaneous preacher, someone that doesn't have a lot of notes, that I kind of come from here and come from here, when I'm preaching, I know intellectually that nine times out of ten, I'm not talking to you when I'm preaching. I'm actually preaching to myself. Because I too, believe it or not, am human. I have struggles, I have faults, I have sins in my own life, and I know that if I struggle with these things, that I'm not the only one that struggles with them. And many times in life, 
what Satan wants to convince you of is that you are the only person going through what you're going through. He wants to isolate us. He wants to shame us so that we don't reach out to each other. Now, unlike shame, guilt is something that's healthy. We we hear about other people have perfected shame. We as Catholics have perfected Catholic guilt. Any of your parents talk about Catholic guilt and how they made you go to church or they made you do these things? If you got that flock note today, Catholic guilt. You like that? But it's an opportunity for us because what guilt really does is helps us recognize our conscience, who it comes from, and we know intellectually and spiritually many times what we're supposed to be doing and why we're supposed to be doing it, but many times our priorities aren't always in line with our consciences. And so when we talk about virtue, it's really trying to bring your conscience in line with those um, realities. It's how can I do what I know I should do? In fact, St. Paul talks about this a lot when he talks about having this thorn in the flesh. Lord, I've come to you time and time again, and I have pled with you to take this thorn from my flesh. But time and time again, you have come to me and said, my grace is enough. My grace is sufficient. And that's true for us who act on that grace in our lives, but it takes a while for those of us who were cradle Catholics who took our faith for granted. How many of us are cradle Catholics, born into the Catholic faith? How many of us are converts, came into the church later in life? So about four four or five converts, about 20 or so cradle Catholics. You converts normally are the better Catholics because we as cradle Catholics, I include myself in that, we tend to take for granted everything that we have. It's like a child that's been spoiled their whole life, and they go out into the world for the first time, and they have all these things given to them forever. We take for granted the fact that, oh, there's bills that we have to pay. Wait, food doesn't just magically end up on my table. I have to do work to pay for these things? Or as the young adults today say, hashtag adulting. We don't realize as kids that many times in life, it takes a whole lot more effort than we see or than we can notice for everything to be brought to us. The same way in the faith. I know for myself, I went to Catholic high school. I went to Mass every Sunday, but two of them from the age of birth to 18. I went on every retreat I could go on. I went to church three times a week, plus Sunday Mass. Wednesday night we had youth group, Thursday night we had Bible study, Saturday night we had youth group again. I was there, unless I had to work, which was only junior, senior year of high school, really, um, throughout the week. I went to all three of those, plus Mass on Sunday and Confirmation on Saturday and class on Sunday every week. Now, I'm not saying that to gloat. What I'm saying, though, is even with all of that time that I spent in church, as soon as I was out on my own for the first time, I left the faith. I always defined myself as Catholic. I never thought that I would go to another church because this is what I grew up with. I was a Catholic. I just wasn't a practicing Catholic. I wasn't even going through the motions. When I was in in college, when I went to OU, the Catholic church is pretty much on campus. You can see it from the dorms. It'd be like standing here and looking at loves down the street. It's literally that close. And they had mass at 5 o'clock every Sunday night. And they'd feed you too. So free meal plus Jesus plus community, I didn't go. And a lot of it was because I took for granted my faith my whole life. I had had these emotional highs. I didn't realize that for me to continue to grow in my faith, it's something that I couldn't just do one day. It's something I'm called to do every day, that I have to grow in virtue. I have to grow in knowledge. I have to grow in understanding of what it means to be a person of faith. Many times we find the opposite of a life based on virtue. When we look at the traditional list of the seven deadly sins, pride, covetousness, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, sloth, those seven deadly sins we hear about a lot. I remember growing up thinking, man, I'm not a horrible sinner. I haven't killed anybody, and I haven't um, committed adultery, and, and I'm a good person. I mean, 
Am I prideful? Well, in saying that I'm a good person, I don't do a lot of bad things, a lot of pride in that. Okay, well, am I covetousness? Well, I, I grew up in a lower middle class family where we didn't have a lot of things. Five kids, I ate fast at dinner. Do you know why big families, the kids eat fast? Because if you don't, you don't get seconds. Growing up, I was the exact opposite of who I am now when it comes to food. If we have a parish function, you will always find me at the end of the line. Growing up, I would push father out of the way and say, back in line, father. And I'd be the first one in line because then I could be first in line for seconds too because it was all about me, all about what I wanted at that moment. Anger, gluttony, lust, and envy, sloth, these things that we hear about a lot, we don't make tangible until we realize the opposites of them. How many times do we look at ourselves and say, man, it's six o'clock at night. What have I done with my day? Now, maybe that's not you guys. I do that pretty often in my life and say, man, I, okay, I did the prayers I need to do. I celebrated Mass, and I, I did everything. I wrote the bulletin articles this week, and I'm even a week ahead on bulletin articles. Amy's so happy. Um, and and I, I, I've heard some confessions, and I had some counseling appointments, and I've done everything I need to do, but I feel like I'm just kind of going through the motions sometimes. Have I been spiritually, let alone in my life, slothful? Have I been intentional about how I'm living, or am I just allowing life to pass me by? These are things that, when we look at what it means to be a person of virtue, they really help us to focus on how we're called to live. Thomas Merton, one of my favorite um, philosophers of the 20th century. In fact, um, he wrote a book called The Seven-Story Mountain that I was reading before I joined seminary that I finally finished last summer. Um, So it only took me 15 years to get through it, but I got through it. Um, But it was his journey of faith um, as a convert um, coming into the faith um, and then eventually becoming a Trappist monk um, in Gethsemane, um, Kentucky, I believe. Um, And a Trappist monk is a monk that doesn't speak. Like, they live lives of silence, a.k.a. the exact opposite of a life that I want to live. But we can learn something when we shut these off and we open these up. In fact, that's what I'm hoping to do next week. Again, every year I go on my um, yearly priestly retreat, and normally it's 48 hours of silence during that retreat. Not because we shouldn't be talking, because we're all together as priests, but because the Lord has something that he wants us to hear every time that we go, but we're so busy worrying about everything else. I've even told the office staff, I said, guys, I'm not looking at my phone except when I wake up and when I go to bed next week. So there's an emergency, hopefully there isn't one, there's an emergency, text me and I'll get to it as quick as I can. Because I have to take care of myself as a priest, as you have to take care of yourselves as parents, as adults as well. And sometimes that means retreating from daily life. And Thomas Merton wrote a lot, though he couldn't speak, he did write a lot, about the spiritual journey, about how we are called to act in our faith. And he said, ultimately the only way I can be myself is to become identified with him who is hidden, the reason and fulfillment of my existence. Therefore, there is only one problem on which all my existence, my peace, and my happiness depend, to discover myself in discovering God. If I find him, I will find myself. And if I find my true self, I will find him. Now, for an extrovert, That is a challenging statement because I use distractions in life to run away from the things that I can't process at that moment. I'm still a kid, and I've said that a lot, and I say that because I am younger, but also in my brain, I still feel like a teenager a lot of times. I don't have the energy, and my body will remind me that I'm not a teenager a lot. But I still play video games. I love watching sports. I went and saw WWE Monday Night Raw live in person on Monday. I'm still a kid. And I say that to say, when I play video games, I didn't realize until about 10 years ago that I played them so I could run away from whatever problems were haunting me in the world. I would find a mind-numbing game that took very little effort to win. Why? Because it would distract me from life that seems so impossible to win at times, you know? When you have those rough days, when you have those tough conversations, when you get those bad grades back for the first time, and you're like, huh, 
I hope that I don't define myself by that test, because if so, I suck. But many times in life, that's what we end up doing. We take what the world throws at us, and we wear it as a badge, not of courage, not a badge of pride most times, but as a badge of shame, saying, this is how the world sees me. But ultimately, below that badge, we have to remember, this is how the Lord sees us, by our hearts. That the Lord seeks every moment of every day for us to break through the crud, for us to break through that exterior of our own lives to get to who we truly are. I talk about it a lot. Who are you truly? In fact, I used to always do this with my freshman um, kids at McGinnis. I'd say, just one person, I'd say, who are you? They'd say, here's my name. No. Who are you? Um, son of so-and-so. No. Who are you? Um, son of so-and-so. No. Who are you? And eventually, after five minutes of asking the same question, they finally get, oh, I'm a child of God. That's what you want, right? Yes, that's, but, oh, but that's what I want you to want. I want you to want to be a child of God. Because when we identify ourselves as children of God, everything else begins to make sense. When we look at the gospel, when we look at how Christ lived his life and all that he sought to lead us to, it all comes forth from that truth and that reality. You are a child of God, created in his image and in his likeness. Not externally, because if so, God, this is the best you can do, really? But internally, you've been created in the image and likeness of God, each and every one of us. And the more that we begin to understand that, the more we can begin to grow into who he has called us to be. The more the gospel begins to make sense. That when Christ says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, we don't look at him and say, bless your heart. Instead, we say, thank you for blessing my heart. Because Christ's yoke truly is easy. It's simple in the sense of when we look at the world and how convoluted and complex it can be at times, and then we look at the life of faith, what does Christ tell us? Love. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Why? Because God first loved you. In fact, this weekend's gospel, I think, puts this really well. Let's switch microphones here. And so we hear in this weekend's gospel, according to Luke, Jesus addressed this parable to those who were convinced of their own righteousness and despised everyone else. Two people went up to the temple area to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee took up his position and spoke this prayer to himself. O God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of humanity, greedy, dishonest, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I pay tithes on my whole income. But the tax collector stood off at a distance and would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and prayed, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, the latter went home justified, not the former. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. When we look at a life of virtue, I think this gospel really sums up for us some of our struggles. It becomes easy when things are going easy to look at the world and say, oh, you fools, you're just getting it all wrong. But see in that tax collector, the man who knew he was a sinner, and looks at the Lord and says, Be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. When we get to the true heart of who we are, as children of God, we don't identify ourselves by our sins, but we recognize in our sins that it's us that has divided ourselves against God and not God that has abandoned us. It's a very small line of justification there, but it's a very important division to make. It's us who turn against God, not God who turns away from us. 
And so as Thomas Merton was saying, the closer I get to understanding who God is, the closer I can truly understand who I am. And the more I understand my true self, the more I can truly understand the love of God. We gain a virtue by practicing behaviors associated with that virtue. In fact, there's two virtues that I tell people, don't pray for these. I've talked about these before. Because how do you grow in virtue? You practice it. So unless you are spiritually, emotionally, and fortuitously prepared to grow in them, never pray for patience or humility. And I mean that in the most pastoral way I can say it. Because God will give you opportunities to practice them. If you're having a bad day and you pray for patience, your day probably will not get better. In fact, you will see more obstacles put into that day by a lot than if you didn't pray for patience. Because when we're in the storm, we don't have that strength. We aren't relying on God's strength. We're relying on ourselves. Because I can put on my boots and tie up my laces and I can do this by myself. Except that we can't. And Christ tells us that time and time and time and time and time and time again. So how do we grow in virtue? We have to practice those virtues. If you want to be a virtuous person... We act virtuously. By practicing virtuous behavior, we develop those virtuous habits, and therefore we become virtuous people. The struggle, though, is we are impatient when it comes to virtue. We are impatient when it comes to God. We are impatient when it comes to our spouses. We are definitely impatient when it comes to our parents, our mothers-in-law, and our kids. Right? We want them to do exactly what we want. Don't even make me tell you the first time. Just get it done. You know you what you should be doing. Just do it. And then we get angry and we get frustrated because things aren't going the way we want them to go. Because we don't realize the world doesn't revolve around us. Like, growing up, that is the typical attitude of our adolescence. The world revolves around me. As we grow and mature as adults, we realize... The world exists whether I'm in it or not. How do I play my part? So when we talk about the body of Christ that we are all members of, how do we play our role in that body of Christ? Some of us are doers. Some of us volunteer for everything. Thank you so much for all the things you guys volunteer for. Some of us show up in our, in our teachers here at church. Some of us show up in our teachers at school. Some of us cook. Thank you people for cooking. I like it a lot. Some of us are good at hobbies. Some of us are good. I would love if I could be half the golfer that the Laniuses could be. I have tried. This gets in the way of this. Can't do it. I'm a baseball player, not a golfer. I'm like, eh, eh, I can't, I can't do it. But those are different skills that different people have that I haven't been able to embrace. Why? Because not everybody was made with the same gifts talents, and skills. I thank God for Eric every day. Behind the scenes, nobody sees him. He's back in his little corner, making sure that we can go live stream, making sure the microphones work, doing all this behind the scenes stuff that I would be lost without. In fact, before moving here, do you know how I would live stream anything? I would take my cell phone, go to Facebook Live, put it on selfie mode, put my phone there, and I talked to myself on the screen. That was live streaming mass for a year and a half. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Thank you for those who have put together this amazing sound system, this amazing ability for us to reach people nationally, internationally. In fact, we had um, a gentleman come to mass on Sunday and he said, Father, believe it or not, I've actually been following you guys' live mass for three years from Los Angeles. And he came to mass because he's looking at possibly moving out here. And he said, oh, is that Eric? Is that the Eric? I'm going to go meet him because he's pretty cool. 
And he is pretty cool. But how awesome is it that we from western Oklahoma, from a town of 10,000 people, can reach people outside of our normal sphere because of a pandemic that helped us get all this technology that we didn't even know we needed. I don't know how old our live streaming is, but I know for me, the first week that we shut down mass, I turned my phone on and found out what Facebook Live was. Didn't have a clue beforehand. And just put my phone up there. It's like, we're going to try this. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, hit. We tried. Go to EWTN. That's all you got. But we learn and grow by seeking outside of our comfort zone. Even when it comes to the faith, there are things in the faith that are uncomfortable for us. Even as a priest, there are conversations I don't like to have. Do you know what my number one conversation I hate having is? Money. By far my least favorite conversation. We just had our finance council meeting last night, so good luck. Now, we're doing fine, don't worry. <laughs> but, but, but it's one of those things that nobody likes to talk about money, but it's a reality that in the world we're in, did you see the, the um, inflation growth this summer? 9%? It's like, oh, we only factored into our budget about 4%. This is going to be interesting, possibly. We're already over budget because we didn't realize that would make a difference. But that means that my groceries and the groceries for the food bank and all these other things are, are they're talking about our electrical expenses are all going to go up this year. It's supposed to be a really cold winter. Oh, no. How are we going to make budget? How are we going to make budget? Well, those are things where I go to the Lord and say, Lord, you want this to work? You take care of it. I'll do my part, of course, talk about it when we need to talk about it. But we, as the body of Christ, truly believe and practice the adage of many hands make light work. And so we come together recognizing how we can contribute to our faith, how we can contribute to our faith community. Some of us, again, are teachers. Some of us are doctors, lawyers. Um, some of us are, are great stay-at-home parents. Some of us are great at whatever it is we are because that is what God has blessed you with. Embrace that. Find within whatever it is God has called you to do to do the best you can at it. I was a waiter for six years before joining seminary, and I loved it. A lot of people will look at waiters and say, oh, what is your adult job going to be? It's like, well, I'm 22. This is it right now that I went to seminary. But I embraced every job I ever had. From when I was the assistant groundskeeper at the age of 13 at my home parish, where my job for 5, 15 an hour was go pick weeds. Then I found I was allergic to them. But go pick weeds for five hours a day, five days a week. I wanted to be the best weed picker that could be. And then I went to working at a ballpark in Oklahoma where my job was to take tickets or to make popcorn. I wanted to have the best tasting popcorn you've ever had tasted. Had nothing to do with me. Just meant taking it off the rack before it burns. Lesson learned. <laughs> but whatever we do in our lives, the more we practice it, as that old saying goes, practice makes what? It doesn't make perfect, but that's what we say. Practice makes better. And how do we grow in the faith? One day at a time. How do we grow in a profession? One day at a time. But it means we have to practice it. We have to be intentional about it. Only if children grow up knowing how to distinguish between good and evil, right and wrong, Will virtuous behavior, and therefore good people, characterize the behavior of society in general? What do we teach our children? How do we teach our children? In the 21st century, we do very little teaching, myself, parents, and grandparents included, because our kids are... Our kids are taught by these more than they are by these every day. In fact, it was interesting. I was playing around on TikTok the other night and I went on there. And one of our parishioners followed me and it's like, oh, this will be fun. I'm going to put a Catholic TikTok on there and people are going to learn about the gospel. And then we're like, oh, unfollow. He's boring now. He's talking about faith. He's talking about these things that actually matter. But most of our kids go to technology so much more than we realize. And I say that because I go to technology a whole lot more than I realize many times. 
It goes back to that sloth part of the seven deadly sins. How much time do I waste on this that I could be doing other things? Multiple times a year, I have a cleanse. Sometimes you have that Facebook friend cleanse where I haven't talked to them for 17 years. Eh, I, I, I can do away with them on Facebook. It's the same way with apps sometimes on my phone. I have a very um, eccentric, you couldn't tell, and addictive personality. I, I get on one game, and I'm on there, and I'm on there, and i be the best at it, be the best at it, be the best at it, and I realize, huh, I just spent seven hours a day playing a video game when I could have been doing other things. Now, that could just be me, and I recognize that that is a fault that I have. That, that is one of my struggles, is that this is where I escape to. But ultimately, for us as human beings, do you know what the ultimate escape should be for each and every one of us? Sitting where you're sitting right now. Not listening to me, though I appreciate you guys being here, but sitting where you're sitting right now. Coming into the church, being in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, present in the Eucharist. That if that is what we long to do for eternity, because that is what heaven is, being in the presence of God for eternity... If we don't practice it on this side of heaven, why do we desire it on the other side of life? It's a real challenging question for many of us. We're like, well, it reminds me of a line that my history teacher and English teacher used to tell me because I'd fall asleep in both those classes. After they wake me up, they say, Danny, you can sleep when you're dead. But we take that same observation and put it on our faith. I'll finally have time for God when? When sports season is over. When the kids have graduated high school. When the kids have graduated college. When the kids start having their own kids and move out. When the kids fill in the blank. And I'm only going to ask this person because she's the oldest person in here. Teresa, have you found that any of those blanks have ever been filled? Still easy to put those excuses in there of I'll get to it when. It's like between a husband and wife, oh, I'll get to the dishes when I have time. Well, if you don't make time, you're never going to find it. It's the same way when it comes to practicing virtue, when it comes to being a person of faith. And so being that model for our children, teaching them right from wrong, true right from true wrong, because our world is trying to teach our kids a false right from wrong. The new teaching that's coming out there isn't new. In fact, it pre-existed Christ. Did you know that many of our kids are learning it is valid to live by the motto, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? I can't tell you how many kids I have had to say, Turn the other cheek. Oh, that's old. If they hit me, I'm going to hit them back. Guys, this is why war and violence start. This is where it begins with our little ones. And our little ones see it. That's why when Yubia earlier emailed and said, Hey, Father, you sent out that um, text message about adults coming. Can I bring my son? I said, Yes, please, bring your kids. Because they're seeing, and I see you back there with them as well, they see that this is important. And where your kids see you putting your effort, they will want to put their effort as well. I 100% believe that one of the reasons that I am still a person of faith as a priest, as an adult, is because my whole life, from infancy on, my parents were invested in my parish, no matter where we lived. And we lived a lot of different places. But my parents would, after finding where they would live, would immediately start church hunting wherever they were around. What is the church where we feel the most at home? We lived in um, Barksdale Air Force Base in Shreveport, Louisiana. Dad was on parish council. Lived at Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany in a small, small town called Jettenbach, off of base. Found two different churches on base. Found the one that worked for us. Went to Mass. Mom finally retired from the Air Force. So what did she do? She joined Help in the Red Cross and joined the Rosary Bunch. We don't have a Rosary Bunch, but do you know what the Rosary Bunch would do 
every week, they'd sit and make rosaries and pray for each other and then donate those rosaries to the soldiers that were being sent out to battle. I learned that as a kid. I learned that I can easily do the rope ones, the metal ones, needle nose pliers, I'm going to hurt myself because I'm accident prone. And then we went to just tying the knot rosaries. I know Father Philip used to always make those in a confessional when he was hearing confessions. I don't know those things. <laughs> that's not a talent that God has given me. Working with my hands outside of doing this, playing video games, that's the only hand skills I really have. But then we moved to Oklahoma, found a parish. Moved to North Dakota, found a parish. Moved back to Oklahoma, moved back to that parish Dad was on parish council here, finance councils here. Did he have those gifts and talents? No. My dad could not carry a tune, though he could carry a tune better than mom. And he joined the choir. He had a guitar and a tambourine. You will never see a tambourine here at Mass, don't worry. But we may see a guitar from occasion, from time to time. There goes my sticky notes. But he always had his love language with God. And dad's love language with God was music. Have you noticed how that I've talked about that's my love language with God in the past as well? If you paid attention at least. Because God wants to speak to your heart. And for some of us, and for all of us, he does it in a different way. For me, it's always been music. In fact, I did a seven-day silent retreat in seminary. Two days in, I went to my spiritual director because we met with them once a day. That was the only time I got to talk during the, during the retreat. And I said, I am struggling. Silence is not my friend. <laughs> I need help. She said, well, what has helped you in the past? I said, music. Music and journaling. Well, take your journal, take some headphones, go outside and listen to music. Now, it wasn't listening to like Metallica and Linkin Park and things like that. It was listening to Kathy Tricoli and Avalon and Praise and Worship and Marty Haugen and some of these things we'd sing at Mass. Or when I did a 90-day um, um, uh, event a couple of years ago called Exodus 90, it was instrumental music. So now I've got a whole playlist of 195 songs of instrumental praise and worship. I know the songs are the words, or the words of the songs. But it's just calming, peaceful music. Because for me, music helps me, I learned at an early part in my life, it helps me focus. Because I'm so distracted as an ADHD person, I struggled with reading comprehension growing up. The only way that I could actually pay attention was if I listened to music, and then when I heard the song again, it bring me right back to that passage that I read. It's like, that's the weirdest thing in the world. So to this day, when I hear certain songs, it'll bring me back to certain moments in books that I've read in the past. Why? Because that's how I focus. And so when I pray my holy hour, I have a playlist that's an hour long. It starts with O Salutaris. Why? Because that's where we start the holy hour, <laughs> when we do adoration. And it ends with Holy God, we praise thy name, because that's how we end a traditional hour of adoration and benediction. But immersed throughout there are other praise and worship songs speaking about the Lord, speaking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the different persons of the Trinity, but also, you're a good, good Father, reminding me of why this matters. And so when we learn and teach our kids about our own lives of faith, one of the hardest things for us to do as Catholics is to talk about our faith. That's one of the things that our non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters, the, the, the Protestant Christians do well. They witness to their faith. We're like, I show up, that's my witness. It's like, well, yeah, that, that's part of it, yes. <laughs> but how do we talk about our faith with our kids? Because if we don't talk about our faith and our own relationship with God, rarely will your kids hear it from their classmates in the world. And many times when they hear it in the world, they won't hear what we actually believe. In fact, we had a kid that came... Uh, two weeks ago, um, and Katie came and asked this question to me after class. She said, um, one of our kids had this question that her geography teacher said about Catholics in school. Is it true? And it's like, oh, geez, here we go. 
one I hadn't heard. Is it true that if the Pope touches you, you go straight to heaven? I said, no, it's not true. That'd be fantastic. But let's break apart that question and that argument. Jesus. Many people touched Jesus, and he touched many people. Did they all go to heaven immediately because he touched them? No. Do we pay attention to the gospel? Was it last week or the week before where Jesus heal, heals nine people with leprosy and only one comes back? He healed ten. The other nine went on with their lives. Oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. But many times when we talk about the faith, when we talk about God, we aren't talking with these. We're rarely talking with these. We're talking with these more than anything because we aren't talking logically. We're just kind of taking what we've heard. I found an interesting quote, um, and a lot of these quotes are, are, all the quotes are coming from this. The survival of the earth depends on it being populated by people who, from any religious or philosophical perspective, cultivate cardinal virtues. I read that and it's like, huh. Our population of earth, the continuation of our species, depends on our ability to cultivate and grow in virtue. I watch a lot of TV. I talk about it a lot. I enjoy TV because, to me, TV and movies are like good books that I don't have time to read. I can get, give me the Cliff's Notes. I want to watch it. I want to see because I learn and grow from it. How many post-apocalyptic movies, shows are out there where these people have to come together to form a society? And when they form a society not based on virtue, it seems to always fall apart, right? What was that book that we all had to read as kids that had the, that the pudgy character, Piggy, they called him? Lord of the Flies, yeah. Did anybody else have to read that growing up, Lord of the Flies? It's where these kids, if I remember correctly, they were on a, it was a shipwreck or a plane wreck, and they were all abandoned on this island, and it was just adolescent kids, and so they had to form this society. And they finally, eventually formed some rules that if you're holding the conch shell, that means you can talk. If not, shut up. And they end up breaking the conch shell. And it's, and it's very post-apocalyptic in the sense of there was mass chaos and very little order. But that's many times how our world is when it's a world not based in virtue. Because... If we don't have any standard, we can justify doing, thinking, being, growing anything we want to because who's going to tell me no? Might is power. If I have the power, I can do whatever I want to. That's how a lot of totalitarian dictators live. Having just been to Germany, reminded of that in when people have power, people tend to flock to them. Why? Because they want a piece of that power. One of the reasons that people came to Jesus was to be healed. Another reason was because he was popular. We see this in our world today. Who are the people that people want to be like today that they seek to model their lives after? Celebrities. Why? Because they're popular. Because they have something that I am covetous of. Notice that? They have something that I want. They're wearing a certain brand. They're doing their hair a certain way. They're, they're, they're looking a certain way. The early 2000s, all the boys, even though we made fun of the boy bands, all wanted to be like the guys in the boy bands. Why? Because they got all the girls. And girls wanted to be with them. Nobody. But that was okay. I thought that I wanted and needed and desired something that I didn't have because I didn't know what it was I was really longing for, and it's ultimately that same longing that we all have in our lives. It's a longing for Christ. It's a longing for love. It's a longing for virtue in my life. And so we talk then about the theological virtues and the cardinal virtues. The theological virtues we hear about all the time in Scripture, faith, hope, and love. But rarely do we talk about the four cardinal virtues, and all seven of these we're going to have a class specifically for each of these virtues as we go through this year. 
So the four cardinal virtues are prudence, justice, fortitude or courage, and temperance. Prudence enables us to apply our knowledge of the good to particular situations. Notice, most times when you hear the word prudence in society, my brain, and it may not, maybe just be my brain, my brain goes to prudish. That, oh, you, you just, you're just a prude. You, 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 we'll make it sexual very quickly, right? That you have to be prim and proper, and if you aren't like that, then uh, whatever. But that's not what prudence is. Prudence enables us to apply our knowledge of the good to particular situations. As a priest, I have to be a prudent person. In fact, when, I set, when we sent out that flock note today, it took me 10 minutes to word it because I didn't want to offend anybody. Because it was a, okay, so if I put this out there, and I knew as soon as I walked in the door I'd hear it, which I did, was, okay, who's going to be mad that I sent this? The parents that don't want to come and the teachers. The teachers are going to be really mad because the teachers are mad at me as it is because they have to be down there. They want to be in here. They want to grow. They want to learn. That's why Jill's here because she's like, I'm not teaching this year. I'm going to class. It worked out. Thank you. Jill as well. Um, or Julie as well. It's one of those that we want to have that ability to grow and learn ourselves so we can then share. The problem is we only have so many catechists at this point in our growth. My hope in the next 10 years is that we get on a two-year process where every two years our catechists don't have to teach for two years so they can be in here and grow. And so guess what? In two years, I want some of you guys to be back there catechizing our young people in English and in Spanish. Because many of our young people, many of our adults, are just as lost as we are. And they need someone to lead us and guide us in the faith. I, however, am just one person. I know that I don't know everything. I'm one of the youngest people in this room besides the little ones and some of the parents. And I recognize that. But I also know because of the last 15 years of intentionally seeking to grow in my own faith, that when it comes to the faith, I do have some wisdom, which is kind of terrifying to say because, again, this is the same guy that went to watch WWE Monday Night Raw on Monday. I understand that. I'm an oxymoron. What can I say? So that's prudence. It enables to apply our knowledge of the good to particular situations. Justice, one of those very contentious words in our society today, Justice maintains appropriate relationships within the community, whether that community be the family, the city, the country, or the world. That's what it means to be just, to maintain appropriate relationship, not right and wrong specifically. But that is part of it. When we learn that good, good from evil, right from wrong, we learn what it means to be a just society. Justice in Moses' time was what? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. When Christ came along, he said, no, 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 no. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, love your enemy. Because it was never meant to be an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. That is not justice. If that were justice, we need to pray for God's mercy that he is not just with any of us. Because if sin is an act against God, we are all up a creek without a paddle if God is truly justice and not merciful. Fortitude or courage regulates fear, aversion, and aggressiveness. Fortitude and courage regulate fear, aversion, and aggressiveness. It doesn't see, say turns against them. It doesn't say dissuades them. It says regulates them. Fear can be healthy. As a kid, I learned fear really young because I was a really dumb kid. And I mean that in the most loving, pastoral way towards myself that I can. I did a lot of dumb things. But as a kid, I had to learn by making mistakes. I was that idiot kid that played with forks around light sockets. You make that mistake once. If you make it twice, it is your own fault. 
I burned my hand. Funniest story ever, when we lived in Germany, I love winter. This weather out here, I came over in a hoodie. It's like, oh, this is my weather. I like this. But I love snow. I grew up with snow. I don't like Oklahoma winters where it's just frigid and no snow. If it's going to be frigid, give me snow. The heck with this ice. I want snow. I want to make snow cones. I want to make slushies. I want to put someone's face in the snow. I'm a kid. I want to go sledding. But I want to eat snow. And so we had this metal fence next to our house. Those of you who have seen the Christmas story know what's happening here. I went and saw this layer of snow, and I said, ooh, yeah. Right after the vigil mass for Christmas, I go outside. Mom and Dad are parking the car, and they just, like, put everything up in the car, and I go outside, and it's like, if you don't know what I'm doing there, my tongue is stuck to the pole. So I did learn you want cold water, not hot water, to remove tongues from stuck metal. Because hot water sticks it even faster and sticks more of it. Lesson learned. Learn from my dumbness. But as a kid, that's how I learned. I did it once. Maybe that's why my taste buds are off. I don't know. (laughs) But I had an active, I've grown up then with sometimes a healthy, sometimes an unhealthy fear. I struggle from anxiety and depression. I talk about that a lot because I know I'm not the only one that struggles with that. But we don't talk about our defects many times because, oh no, I want to to give out the uh, perception that I'm perfect. I'm not perfect. (laughs) You get what you get. I'm doing the best that I can. And part of my anxiety is an irrational fear of the unknown. We all have that. As a military brat who was a Boy Scout who learned the law of the pack... I was, I was Cub Scouts, but you know what I'm going with this. But I learned those different things. I always thought, and I still struggle with this today, just ask Amy and Katie, I want to plan for the best and prepare for the worst. Which seems like a very prudent way to live. Except that it can bring up an unhealthy amount of fear and anxiety in my life. That then puts me on edge. Because what happens if the worst-case scenario happens. Now, of all the times that I have planned for the worst-case scenario and hope for the best, 1% end up being the worst-case scenario-ish. Maybe 1%. But that doesn't stop me from irrationally being afraid of things that I can't control. So one of the things that I'm seeking to grow in is fortitude and courage. Because when we hear fortitude and courage in the world, we think, I'm going to be strong and do it by myself. No. Fortitude and courage is realizing I can't do it by myself. I have to lean on members of the community. And then finally, of the cardinal virtues, we have temperance. Temperance regulates our sensual desires, its proper goal being not asceticism, but moderation. Everything in moderation. I am not a moderation person. (laughs) That is one of my big struggles. If you've known me for five minutes, you know that. I am a person that goes in excess here and goes in excess here and and wants to do everything gung-ho, even if it is to my own personal detriment, because I want to give 110%. The problem is, if you're giving 100%, 100% of the time, you aren't allowing yourself to rest and recover. It's one of the things I've learned in my adulthood. I use that in quotes for a reason, because I'm still, again, in my mind, a kid. But we have to learn balance. The via media, the middle road. Not to be extreme over here, not to be extreme over here, but to be centered. We hear that word a lot. To be centered is to be temperate. But in our world, our world is so schismatic. It's divided. You're either over here or you're over here, whether it be politically, whether it be sports, whether it be academics, whether it be whatever it may be, you are either far left or far right. There is no center. That's not true. (laughs) There is a center, and it somewhat moves this way and somewhat moves this way, but it's pretty much in the middle there. 
Just most people don't strive to be in the middle. We want to strive to be that outlier, that person that everyone looks to for advice. But Thomas Merton would say, no, we want to be centered. We want to be temperate. We want to be balanced in our lives. And so as we go through the next uh, few weeks, we'll break open um, the theological virtues. We'll break open the cardinal virtues and learn not just what they are, but some practical ways of practicing those virtues, of seeking to grow every day in those virtues. The most important thing, though, when we look at virtue, when we look at any potential change in our life, though, is that temperance, that moderation. Don't try and change everything like that. Because outside of a miraculous blessing from God, it's not going to happen. And we have to be okay with that. That if we struggle with vice, habitual sin, even if we go to confession, even when we go to confession, yes, you were forgiven, but we still have the consequences of those vices. They become habits. And as long as it's taken us to grow into those habits, traditionally it takes two to three times longer to change those habits. Well, for those of us who are getting older, many times our habits have been with us for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. So you may never grow completely out of them, and that can be okay. But how do we strive to make that change? Gradually. How do we do a little bit better today than yesterday, a little bit better tomorrow than today? And by a little bit, I mean, if I'm taking two steps forward today, my goal is that I only fall back 1.99 steps. Because at least I've gone forward 0.01 steps. And that may seem like nothing, but when looked at in a full life experience, that growth is exponential. And so as we're getting to the end of our time, thank you guys again for being here. Let us close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we give praise and thanksgiving to you for sending us your Son, the perfect model of faith, the perfect model of virtue. Help us to see in his life, in his teachings, in his manner of living, a proper way for us to mold and conform our minds, our hearts, and our very souls. Help us to begin today this new journey of faith, seeking to embrace love, hoping for all that you have promised to us. Help us to see in all of these virtues that we will study an opportunity for us to change ourselves, to change our families, to change the world. Be with us, guide us, Nurture us and help us to grow. We ask all these things through the intercession of your mother as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Go pick up the kids. Knights of Columbus meeting. <laughs>